Hi, everybody. Sorry for the slow start there. Uh, this is Dr. Joseph McHale. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. And with me is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gerbach Chakar from uh, UT Southwestern. She's an assistant professor there and really is becoming a world expert in so many of the new therapies that we have in multiple myeloma. We'll come back to that in a second. But I want to welcome our Facebook community here for our Facebook Live. We are live broadcasting from Boca Raton, Florida, where we have one of our four flagship education programs for the year. And we call these our patient and family seminars. This is an opportunity to spend pretty much two days with the IMF crew and learn all that you want to learn about myeloma in two days. Uh, we had uh, uh, most of the day yesterday on Friday where we went over the basics of myeloma. We talked about myeloma 101. We talked about advanced care planning, uh, financial considerations in myeloma. We really had an extraordinary afternoon together. And today uh, we've been focusing on many other aspects of myeloma that I'm going to come to in a moment. But we are experiencing Myeloma Action Month. In fact, today kicks off the second half of Myeloma Action Month. And so we uh, appreciate all of you in the social media world who have been using the hashtag uh, Myeloma Action Month as we try to increase awareness of myeloma, but not just awareness, but action. Um, and talk about action. Yesterday, we had the March for Myeloma. Do, do you see the double entendre there? That was March, but we're also marching. We had a 5K uh, run and walk yesterday. I may be still a little bit sore from it, but uh, Dr. Joe ran. Uh, and we had several people running here in Boca Raton, as well as uh, virtually across the whole world. In fact, we had participants from Paris and France. We had participants from Malta. So thank you for those who participated yesterday uh, to raise more awareness and to raise funds uh, for what we do at the so we're very thankful to be uh, here in Boca Raton. And I want to ask Dr. Carr a little bit about what she was discussing today. So I mentioned that yesterday, we sort of laid the foundation of what are the basics of myeloma? How do we think about myeloma? What is this disease? Um, and we really had a wonderful reception all together last night. But today, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And the crowd was split into two. And those who were newly diagnosed went into one room, and those who had relapsed myeloma came in uh, to this room with Dr. Kumar. So, so Gurbach, maybe tell me a little bit about what you covered in your talk today. So uh, today during my talk, first of all, thank you Joe, for having me. Uh, I've had a great time here so far, meeting and interacting with the patients and Yelik and you and the rest of the IMF staff. So you've been so awesome, so I appreciate that. Um, my talk was mostly focused on relapse myeloma. We talked about what is the classification of my relapse disease, what kind of relapses are there, biochemical versus actual clinical, the nature of the disease, and how do we sort of um, parse through the many options that we have in myeloma. How do we decide when a patient gets an oral option versus an injection? So there's different regimens, as you know, in myeloma. So we, the first half of my talk was talking about conventional therapies that we have, which include monoclonal antibodies and proteasome inhibitors, and how do we uh, pair them together, and, uh, and what factors go into deciding on that treatment. And the second half of my talk is on immunotherapy. Uh, we focus on CAR T-cell therapy, by specific therapy, the differences between them, the approved agents that we have, the side effects that are associated with them, and what sort of the future holds for my mom. So that was, the, in a nutshell, that's what my talk was about. Wow, that's a lot. So let's let's break this down a little bit. So um, one of the great things about a patient and family seminar is that um, we really get a chance to dig a little bit deeper. You know, we have about 250 attendants here um, at the at the patient family seminar. Patients, many are their care partners, um, and one of the great things we get to do is spend a lot more time digging in deep in myeloma and having a lot of time for question and answer. I gotta tell you, after your session, there were so many questions uh, that people wanted to ask, which is great because it gives us an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper. But let me ask a couple of questions myself. So you talked about CAR T-cell therapy, and uh, which is ironic when your last name is CAR. I know you spell it differently, but I think that's wonderful. Um, but, but just, can you go over the real basics of CAR T-therapy? What, what is this all about so that we can we can do that. And while she's answering that, those of you who are listening, you are listening, of course, but I want to remind you that you can submit your questions uh, into uh, the, into Facebook 
Um, and my uh, trusty partner here in crime, Alana Kendall, is with me, and she's going to be feeding us those questions. So I get to ask the first one, but you guys come up with the subsequent questions. Uh, so the question is, again, uh, Dr. Carr, uh, just give us a bit of an overview. How does CAR T cell therapy work? Sure. So over the last 10, 15 years, we've harnessed the power of the immune system, and we realized how do we use the how do we use the immune system to attack the cancer cells, actually. So CAR T cell therapy is where you take the patient's T cells. So there's a process where the patient gets hooked up to a machine, you take the T cells and send them to a lab. In the lab, cells are engineered to recognize some kind of gateway or a door, um, such as, in this case, BCMA, because that is what's currently approved. And we engineer to chart the T cell to express um, uh, uh to target the myeloma cell. And that engineering takes about four to five weeks at minimum. Sometimes it could be longer. It just depends on the robustness and the healthiness of the T cells. And then those T cells get infused back into the patient. Uh, And that's a long, so there's a lot of logistics that get involved when it comes to CAR T cell therapy. Uh, The patients, once the cells are infused back into the hospital, is very closely monitored by the healthcare team for the side effects such as cytokine release syndrome, which is an overactivation of the immune system, or the neurotoxicity uh, that's associated with that overactivation of the immune system. So the healthcare team closely watches the patients in the first couple of weeks. So that's sort of the process of CAR T-cell therapy. But CAR T-cell therapy has revolutionized blood cancers in general, in lymphomas, and now in myeloma. It's, it's made great waves. That's, that's incredible. So, so I mean... It, if you and I had been doing this Facebook Live 10 years ago, it would have sounded like a Star Trek movie, right? Yes. So, so basically what you're saying is I can take white cells out of a patient that are kind of like soldier cells that we can yeah. train. We train them to attack the patient's own myeloma. We actually multiply them in the lab and then give them yes. back to the patient. I mean, yes. that concept is amazing. One of the things you talked about in your lecture, too, was uh, one of the reasons why, as I think you use the word revolutionize, what we're doing is the response rates to CAR-T have been... You know, dramatically higher than pretty much anything else we've ever seen yes. in my life. Comments a bit about yeah, that. so traditionally, whenever we've had a drug come into um, the myeloma space, we look at the single agent. So how is that drug doing on its own? And the response, is, the response rates by themselves is like 20%, 30%, max 40%. And here we have a treatment that, is, that was introduced in the later, late relapses where the disease is very aggressive. And we're getting response rates of 80%, 90%. And not only that, those responses are actually durable. So that means patients are staying in remission longer. And they're also having treatment-free time um, away from the doctor's office. So, you know, that time toxicity that we talk about, you know, cutting down the visits where patients' quality of life is improved. So car has that's why it's revolutionary, because we're not only getting great responses, but we're also getting very durable responses. I mean, that's fantastic. I, I talked about that today. Uh, that my favorite drug to give patients is nothing, nada. Right? Right. And so after someone gets CAR-T, uh, they can actually go off therapy for a period of time. So that's just a single example of the kinds of things that we have time to dig into a little bit more here uh, at the Patient and Family Seminar. So uh, don't forget to send in questions. All right, Alana, start firing questions at me. What, what, about, what do our amazing friends on Facebook want to know about that? They have lots of questions. Is CAR-T treatment less toxic for the patients than the treatment of SCT? Okay, so the question is, is CAR-T cell therapy less toxic than getting a stem cell transplant? And, well, maybe I'll, I'll get you to answer that. Why don't you answer that? Because well, I know you do both. Yes, uh, that's a really good question, actually. They both come with their own flavor of toxicity. So honestly, it is up to you um, when you hear and have a discussion with your doctor about the pros and cons of each therapy. I do think that uh, with stem cell transplant therapy, you have to, the the conditioning therapy, uh, chemotherapy, which is melphalan, can be very toxic. There's a lot of GI side effects. And patients, you can't can't really take frail patients to uh, to stem cell transplant. However, when it comes to CAR T cell therapy, you... You, you, you can even take frail patients through it. Of course, depending on the side effects and, and, and which CAR-T you end up choosing. Um, but they just have a different side effect profile. Right? Like I said, there's CRS and ICANS that's associated with CAR-T cell therapy. And there's it, it, the, 
we're still very early in this in this stage. We have to have longitudinal data on to uh, to truly understand the long long term um, uh, uh, side effects that are associated with it. Stem cell, stem cell transplant is tried and tested, right? It's been around. We've known how to give mouth and We know how to de deal with the side effects that are associated with it. And now we also have long-term data of the side effects that happens when you give someone mouth and plus the longitudinal maintenance therapy that comes, that's Revlimid, right? Um, so I think it's a, one is a tried and tested approach. One is still very early in infancy. But, you know, you mentioned earlier, because we are having these therapies um, where side effect profile is getting tweaked. Stem cell transplant may, may, it's a big may. I'm a transplanter. I still like to do transplants. So it, it may not be done as, uh, as, uh, you know, as much as it's being done right now in, let's say, about five years when we have even better therapies around. Well, I think, I think I'm really glad that uh, that question was sent to us because it really is such an important question. I agree with you. I mean, we have patients who, who aren't really eligible for transplant but can get CAR-T. It just, it just reminds us of the importance of having that conversation with your healthcare team. And we also know one of the talks that we had here at the patient family seminar that I gave was on health disparities. Uh, because we know that historically there have been individuals who have been disadvantaged in getting access to things like stem cell transplant and CAR T cell therapy as well. And so as we evolve and improve the therapies that we're giving, we really hope that we can make them more accessible. All right, Alana, I'm ready for, for another question, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about our patient family center. Okay, we have a couple, lot of questions about CAR T. Is it possible that biospecifics replaces CAR T cell immune therapy? Great question. So I'll answer this one. So we talked a lot about CAR T cell therapy. We also talked about the latest approved therapies, which are called bispecific antibodies. So very quickly to explain that. Uh, Dr. Carr explained so beautifully that CAR T cell therapy is we take T cells out of a patient, we train them to fight against the myeloma and we give them back to the patient. So that's a process. It takes time. It's very effective, as we've said. But we've also introduced this concept of bispecific antibodies, which is a bit of a smoother process, maybe not quite as effective, but it's the notion of we call it bispecific for a reason because these are drugs that have two arms, if you will. They're bispecific. So one arm hooks onto the myeloma cell and the other arm hooks on to a local T cell. Uh, we're each even developing uh, kinds of bispecifics that hook on to other cells. But for now, it hooks on to the T cell. So it's kind of like a matchmaker is the word yes. you use. You know, it makes me think of a fiddler on the roof. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Um, and so it matches these two together and it so-called engages the T cell. So now we don't have to collect cells. We don't have to wait for the manufacturing. We just give this drug directly to patients and it links together their myeloma cells and their own T cells and triggers those T cells to destroy the myeloma. We've seen really remarkable response rates and about 60, 70, sometimes over 75% of patients respond to these bispecific. So to answer the great question, will bispecifics replace CAR-T? You know, my answer, my favorite answer to almost any question is all of the above. So I'm going to say instead of replacing one, we want as many therapies as possible in a disease that we have not yet cured. I want as many things on this buffet as possible because for one patient, CAR-T may be better. For another patient, bispecifics may be better. And we also sadly know that although these drugs work really well, we've not seen a cure from them. And so inevitably, even though someone gets a deep and a durable response from CAR-T, their disease will come back and often we'll use them sequentially and use the biospecific data. All right, Alana, let's get one more question from you. Okay. If someone has myeloma, should their children or siblings be screened for MGUS or smoldering myeloma? Well, we've got a very informed crowd here today. We had a bit of a, a session yesterday where I addressed the issue of familial myeloma. The short answer to the question is we do not have guidelines that would tell you to go and screen family members yet. That being said, we know that there are some families that have multiple patients with myeloma. One of uh, our uh, attendees yesterday was explaining to us that both he and his brother have multiple myeloma. And any one of us, like Dr. Carr and myself, who see a lot of myeloma patients, we inevitably see some families that have several members with myeloma. And in that situation, we may consider testing other people in the family. But that also has to be 
are preceded by a conversation. Because, you know, testing comes with consequences. It can affect health insurance. It can affect life insurance and other things. At the same time, what the IMF is working very hard on, and one of our research initiatives, is to really understand familial myeloma. We've just supported this incredible screening project of over 80,000 people in Iceland to understand the family connections. And I really think we're going to learn a lot more about familial myeloma or what puts people at higher risk within families for multiple myeloma. We know that patients of African descent, like myself, are at greater risk of myeloma. We know that myeloma happens a little bit more in men than in women. But when it comes to family patterns, we still have a lot to learn. All right, Lana, bring us another one. All right, this is a good one. How does yesterday's ODAX outcome impact patients? Oh, wow. So I know you're very familiar with what happened with ODAC yesterday. So maybe I'll just quickly explain the process and you talk about the outcome. So the uh, ODAC or the uh, Oncologic Drug Advisory Committee was is a group is a group that is called on by the FDA. So the FDA has a responsibility, of course, to keep us safe. And we support that. And there were some concerns about whether or not we can use CAR T-cell therapy in earlier lines of myeloma. So myeloma, uh, right now, we can only give CAR T-cell therapy when someone has had four lines of therapy. But a lot of great trials were done in earlier line therapy. And so this ODAC committee is called as sort of expert reviewers to say, is it safe? Is it worth doing? And that conversation happened yesterday. So I'll turn it to you, Agrabox, to tell us a little bit about what the outcome was and what do you think it might mean for myeloma? Sure. So currently there's two FDA-approved CAR T products. One is Avecma, the other one is CAR T. And uh, they were, there's two trials. One is Karma 3, that's for the Avecma product. The other one is for uh, CAR 2, 4, and that's with CAR T. Both of their data was presented yesterday, whether this should be moved up. For Carvicti, the votes were 11 to 0 in moving it up earlier. For Abecma, it was 8 to 3. Uh, but the vote is still favorable. Um, and we don't know the official answer yet, but this is the FDA usually takes into account ODEX recommendations heavily uh, when it makes its decision. I do see CAR T will move up. As a result of that, I do see I do see that there will be a future that CAR T cell therapy moves up. Now, will everyone get access to it at first relapse? I don't think so. Like you said, there are disparities. We have we've had stem cell transplant for ages, yet we have disparities about that, and that's going to be probably one third the cost of CAR T cell therapy. Now, imagine that with a drug that's expensive, and then there's also this lag time and manufacturing process. Um, I, I do see that it's going to move forward. It's going to be the patients who are going to need it the most are going to be the high-risk patients, and that's my take on it. Other people may differ. Um, the high-risk uh, cytogenetics or the functionally high-risk patients, I would see that they're going to get priority in terms of getting it first relapse. We still really have other good options as well, such as uh, you know the monoclonal antibody paired with a second-generation proteasome inhibitor, such as carfilzomib plus dexamethasone, right? The Easter KD versus DKD, I think those are, that's a giant. Yeah. It's hard to beat that data. So they're still going to be, uh, true. not everybody's going to get CAR-T as much as we like to give it. We have to be practical and be in touch with reality. But we also, I mean, I, I agree. With, I'm very happy about what happened. Yeah. There was overwhelming support. You know, it is so important. I always say safety is paramount. We want to look at every signal and make sure that what we give our patients is safe. And of course, every drug and every approach comes with risk. But I think yesterday was a sentinel day for myeloma patients to see that we're very likely going to be able to have greater access to CAR T cell therapy. And it just widens those opportunities. Yes. As you said, yes, it pragmatically not everybody will get it, but we think many more uh, okay. patients will, 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 will get it. Um, this is the sort of thing that, that we even discussed yesterday. So we kick off our patient and family seminars with what we call hot topics in myeloma. And it's, it's a privilege for me to be able to share what's hot and what's the latest in myeloma. I got to present hot topics in myeloma 20 minutes after the first <laughs> vote at the ODAC committee yesterday. So talk about being timely. Yes. And that's what we seek to be uh, at the IMF, of course, uh, not just in conjunction with Myeloma Action Month here in March, but we hold four patient family seminars over the course of the year. 
So right now, of course, we're live broadcast from Boca Raton in Florida, but uh, we want to encourage you to attend one of the three upcoming patient family seminars. So we have one in San Francisco in April. We have one in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota. I'm a little bit biased towards Minneapolis because my wife uh, is from Minneapolis, so I'm sure there'll be like uh, uh, you know uh, chicken pot pies or something provided there. But but we're going to do one in July in Minneapolis, and then we're have uh, in our home city of Los Angeles for the IMF. We'll be in, in Los Angeles in August for our patient family seminar. <clears throat> you can go to the myeloma website myeloma.org and hear more and read more about these uh, patient family seminars. Whereas I mentioned. We really try to spend two days with patients where we get to share with you and their partners, share with you the latest and greatest in myeloma. And this year in particular, we've really made a huge change to our curriculum at the patient family seminars. We're we're doing shorter talks, more interactive talks, covering more topics and having breakout sessions. So uh, this morning when Dr. Carr was talking about relapse therapy, we had in another room Dr. Peter Voorhees from the Levine Cancer Institute in Charlotte talking to us about newly diagnosed myeloma because we know different patients are at different parts of their journey along the way and we want to make sure uh, that we provide opportunity for them. Soon after this, uh, uh, Gerbach and I are skipping lunch to do this uh, Facebook Live, but right after lunch, we're also going to do a breakout where we have one room for patients only and one room for care partners only so that we can ensure that you know, my mom, my mom is often a family sport or a team sport, isn't it? Where the partner, a family member, the friend, whoever it is that's supporting that myeloma patient through the journey, they have needs too. They have uh, um, responsibilities too. And so we want to make sure uh, that we have that opportunity. So uh, wherever you live in the U.S., hopefully it's not too far from one of our patient family seminars. And hopefully you can attend uh, in the not so distant future. All right, let's turn it back to Alana for another question. So a lot of questions about stem cell transplant versus no stem cell transplant. What do you do? Wow. So that is a question of questions, and I'm more than happy to let Dr. Carr answer that. <laughs> um, that's a very, well, it's a straightforward yet complex question, right? Because it's each individual care form. We're at that point in myeloma therapy that we actually can say that you can defer a transplant. We weren't always in this space, right? Mm-hmm. 20 years ago, transplant it was it. Um, when you didn't have these novel image or, or proteasome inhibitors. But that being said, um, I think several factors play a role in deciding whether transplant is the way to go or to depart transplant or actually no transplant. One is age and comorbidities if you have the physical health status to actually go through transplant. That, that's a major factor, right? And the second is patient preference. Um, and, and, and the third is actually the genetics of the cancer. If there's high-risk cytogenetics, um, this is the one, I think that is also an unmet need in myeloma. Um, in this space, I feel that uh, very rarely you will get me to say you should det- defer transplant. I will always recommend transplant uh, unless you're an extreme age where it's not safe for me to do so, right? Um, uh, so cytogenetics and the risk status of the disease plays a role. But if you have standard risk disease and you're young, um, let's say you're in your 50s and you're not really up to doing a transplant right now, but you do have standard risk risk disease. Um, I would say, yes, then there is a possibility of deferring transplant because you get five, six years and then you need transplant, you'll be 56, still be in good shape. Um, However, if you're in the later 60s and early 70s, the decision to do transplant is now because after this, um, you're going to be much older and you may not have the ability to tolerate the transplant. Keep in mind in the trials, 20% 20% of the patients who deferred transplant were not able to get the transplant later on because of either disease-related toxicity or treatment-related toxicity that they experienced. So it's a very individual discussion. This is between you and your doctor. Um, the genetic, the cytogenetics and the high-risk status plays a big role. And the rest is, you know, what's the support system? Like? Do they have the time? Can they actually take out time from work? So many factors at play, right, that help you decide. Absolutely. I, I think it's not our absolute yes or no yes, phenomenon. Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quote a little bit from Dr. Osmani. Uh, so Dr. Osmani today gave us an extraordinary lecture on what he sees as the future of multiple myeloma. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't able to be here in person um, uh, for several reasons, but we were very glad that he was able to join us on the screen and, and gave us a talk of the future of myeloma. And, and I think, you know, you said it so perfectly, Dr. Carr, that, that we have a tried and true 
therapy that works. Uh, but we have seen this evolution in myeloma where we're moving to more immunotherapies and newer treatments. And it's quite likely that maybe we wouldn't take it entirely off the table, but that we're going to be doing a lot less transplant in the future. Now we're doing many of these clinical trials. In fact, I know even at my site we have a clinical trial open where patients either go to CAR-T or transplant after their induction therapy. And I think we're going to learn a lot about this uh, in the coming uh, years to come. So I'm going to turn to Alana for one last question. Believe it or not, we're getting close to our time to wrap up. But let's take one more before we wrap it up. How important is using ducks? Ah, uh, <laughs> this is one of my favorite questions. How important is it to use dexamethasone? So dexamethasone or as a steroid drug, and we talked a lot about um, dexamethasone here at the uh, Patient and Family Seminar. Uh, I often think of it, and I even show a picture in my clinic, I think of it as like the booster rockets on the shuttle. It really helps boost almost every treatment we use in myeloma. But the reality is, after a while, you want those booster rockets to fall off. And there has been this movement that I've entitled hashtag down with Dex. Um, and we really want to see um, this, this take hold where many years ago, uh, uh, an individual who worked with the IMF, Mike Katz, convinced one of our large myeloma committees to say, uh, why don't we do a clinical trial that compares a lot of DEX to lower dose DEX? We used to give a ton of DEX. We're still giving a lot of it. And we showed unequivocally that lower doses of DEX were better. Well, I think we're going to even go lower now. And so dexamethasone is important. It's important to talk to your provider about the dosing. But many of us now are using a strategy where we choose the correct dose, where we think it's the correct dose, and really only give that for a couple of months and then start to reduce it. And why? Because it comes with lots of side effects. It affects people's sleep, their mood, their blood pressure, their blood sugar. It can have a lot of negative effects. So it's the drug we hate and we love. Um, and so we really think in the future, even as we design clinical trials now, we're starting to see a lot less dexamethasone being used because of many of the great agents that Dr. Carr has shared with us today. Well, believe it or not, it's time to wrap up. But I want to thank everybody in our Facebook community. Sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions or streaming in, but thank you for engaging with us today. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about myeloma, you've learned a little bit more about the IMF, and you've learned a little bit more about our flagship program here, the Patient and Family Seminar. We hope to see you in either San Francisco or Minneapolis or like Los Angeles in the near future. Otherwise, please always feel open to engage with us. Uh, at the website of myeloma.org, we have an info line we have over 160 support groups across the country, lots of ways to interact with us. And lastly, I want to thank you very much for joining me uh, today uh, to sharing with us your expertise, your experience in myeloma, your passion for, for myeloma patients uh, and their providers. I'd like to also thank our sponsors, uh, 270 Bio, Amgen, Binding Site, Bristol-Myers Squibb, GSK, Johnson & Johnson, Carrier Farm, Pfizer, Regeneron, and Sanofi. Uh, for supporting our work here at the Patient Family Seminar. And don't forget, you still have a half month left to celebrate Myeloma Action Month, hashtag Myeloma Action Month. Make sure uh, that you get involved and support the work we're doing so that every patient can live better with myeloma to their full health, as our president and CEO shared with us in his president's address today. But that really is the goal. As we seek to find a cure, we want our patients to live their best lives. Thanks again. I appreciate your attention.